following the return of the delegations from the UN. A May 11, 1959 declassified State Department report analysed the situation in Southern Cameroons. It was authored by John Emerson, the US Consul General in Lagos, Nigeria. Emerson noted that the KNDP wanted a simple vote on secession from Nigeria, yes or no, whereas the KNC-KPP alliance insisted on the two extremes, union with Nigeria or with French Cameroon. He went on to say that the KNDP was confident that the vote for secession would be decisive and would be favoured by over 90% of the voters. According to the report, Endele conceded his alliance would lose if secession was on the ballot. Endele acknowledged that the only way he could win was to pit the people against the two undesirable choices. He hoped that the fear of joining French Cameroon would be greater than the fear of staying in Nigeria. In June 1959, the UK government embarked on its first of many post-election projects to pull the rug from under the KNDP's plans of asking for separation from Nigeria and independence for Southern Cameroons. To appreciate how the UK went about this, it is worthy to note that although it had gained full regional status in 1958, the Southern Cameroons government was never independent of the UK government. It reported to a hierarchy of the UK colonial administrators, including the Deputy Commissioner, the Commissioner, the Governor and the Secretary of the Colonies in London. Under these circumstances, Deputy Commissioner Malcolm Milne hired Sir Sidney Philipson, a former financial advisor at the University Hospital of Ibadan in Nigeria as a temporary advisor to the government of Southern Cameroons. Sir Philipson's mandate was to create a report of the financial and economic consequences of Southern Cameroons separation from Nigeria. The preamble of Sir Philipson's report was quite revealing as to the real intent of his undertaking. He opened by stating that although his report was in no way politically motivated, it was necessary to acknowledge that Southern Cameroons had before it four options as the way forward. 1. Integration with Nigeria 2. Separation from Nigeria and a further period of trusteeship 3. Separation from Nigeria and eventual integration with French Cameroon 4. Separation and independence Sir Philipson then swiftly and unequivocally dismissed the last option stating that support for separation and independence was almost non-existent in the territory. He couldn't have been more political if he'd tried. He conceded that if his assignment was to determine the economic consequences of Southern Cameroons separating from Nigeria to eventually integrate with French Cameroon, the view of a single investigator working within fairly strict time limits and without wide consultations would be of no value. Therefore, by a process of elimination, presuming that option one of joining Nigeria had no negative consequences and therefore did not warrant any analysis, Sir Philipson concluded that his assignment should be concerned with the consequences of separating from Nigeria with a further period of trusteeship. In his general approach, Sir Philipson noted that Southern Cameroons wanting to break away from rich and powerful Nigeria after 40 years of association would only create problems for itself that could otherwise be avoided and that this path represented the hard way forward. Sir Philipson confessed that he would have to make personal judgments in arriving at his conclusions but was quick to add that his personal judgments would not substantially affect his conclusions. The analysis leading up to 
hard facts and forecasts. We're riddled with disclaimers, calls for greater analysis, and references to reasons not to trust the conclusions he would present. Taking all of this into consideration, and adding in some fuzzy math, Sir Philipson concluded that, in 1959, Southern Cameroons was broke, and would probably remain broke, for the foreseeable future. This has since come to be known as one of the many falsehoods propagated by the UK government to weaken Southern Cameroon's case for separating from Nigeria and becoming independent. As shown earlier, and contrary to Sir Philipson's shoddy work, Southern Cameroons would have been profitable on an annual basis by almost £1 million in 1959. The questions that beg to be asked are, why did the UK government have to hire an expert to create a financial report for the UN that it should normally have been generated as required by the trusteeship agreement? Why didn't the UK government turn to the same colonial statistics office that generated the annual reports for the years 1944 to 1954 to produce the 1959 report? The answer was quite simple. The UK government wanted to create ammunition to heavily influence the choice and language of the two plebiscite questions in favour of its interests. It is no coincidence, therefore, that Sir Philipson's final report was delivered to the UN Trustee Council on October 9th, 1959, just in time for the resumption of the debates on the future of Southern Cameroons. Whether a deflection or the truth, in his memoirs, Malcolm Main would later credit S.T. Mooner with the idea of hiring a financial consultant he claimed Muna confided in him that the Fonshire government was seeking financial advice on the consequences of separating from Nigeria, which he gladly obliged. From April through August 1959, political parties, leaders of youth organisations and traditional rulers held hundreds of meetings to canvass support for their positions, with the aim of driving consensus towards the two plebiscite questions. The Commissioner of Southern Cameroons, J.O. Field, convened a delegates meeting in Manfi, chaired by none other than Sir Sidney Philipson. The conference was attended by several hundred people, including 45 delegates, representing political parties, influential organisations, native authorities and chiefs. True to himself and his mission, Sir Philipson opened the conference by reiterating that Southern Cameroons only had three options open to it, none of which included separation and independence, and were integration with Nigeria as a self-governing region separation from Nigeria with an extended period of trusteeship, separation from Nigeria followed by early negotiations for reunification with Cameroon. Next, Foncha addressed the conference and repeated his earlier stance that reunification could not be imposed on any part of Cameroon. This could only be agreed by those who were ripe for it. In his opinion, it could therefore not be an option on the plebiscite. He stuck to his position of separation and independence. Endele conceded that the majority of Southern Cameroonians supported separation without reunification, but ultimately, and for by then obvious reasons, he stuck to his position that the two plebiscite questions should be association with Nigeria versus reunification with Cameroon. The rest of the parties and leaders repeated earlier stands and opinions, albeit toning down their messages to appease the Council of Chiefs 
and natural rulers who were strongly in favour of independence. On behalf of the Council of Chiefs, the Fon of Barfoot summoned up their position as follows. French Cameroon is fire and Nigeria is water. I support secession from Nigeria without reunification. At the end of the conference, the delegates voted 67% in favour of secession from Nigeria as the first question and independence as the second plebsite question. 33% in favour of integration with Nigeria and reunification with Cameroon as the second question. After combining these results and arriving at a compromise, the conference agreed that the people's wishes dictated that the plebsite questions be integration with Nigeria and secession and independence. As soon as the Manfi conference ended, Foncher, Endele and others, accompanied by UK Commissioner J.O. Field, headed off to New York. Once more, Endele and Foncher repeated earlier arguments in defence of their respective plebsite question choices. It was generally accepted the first plebsite question would be that of integration with Nigeria. The fierce debates revolved around the second question, whether it was going to be secession and independence, or reunification with French Cameroon. Foncher was pressured to defend his argument for secession instead of reunification. He was asked for details on how reunification would unfold with French Cameroon. With the goal of increasing his odds of winning, Endele insisted on reunification as the second question. He was betting that voters would choose integration with Nigeria over reunification. Endele argued that Foncher had no clear plan for Southern Cameroons and was hiding his incompetence under the cloak of continued trusteeship administration. He challenged Foncher to another round of elections as a means of settling the future of Southern Cameroons instead of a plebsite whose results he said would be irreversible and could be regrettable. On his part, Bile argued that if Southern Cameroons were to break away from Nigeria, it would cause the territory irreparable harm. He argued that Cameroon was an artificial creation and the idea of reunification was in itself questionable. When the hearings resumed, a week later, Billet reversed his position and stated that the UN should decide on what was just, not who was right, and asked for more time for Southern Cameroons to decide its future. Billet's 180 degree turn was the result of a private negotiation organised by Andrew Cohen and representatives of the Afro-Asian states aimed at agreeing on the second plebsite question. Despite these off-record private negotiations, Andrew Cohen leveraged Sir Philipson's bleak financial report on Southern Cameroons to persuade and recruit representatives of Afro-Asian states, including India's Krishna Menon, to support the UK's position that Southern Cameroons was not economically viable and therefore should not be allowed to become independent. The Andrew Cohen-led agreement brokered between Foncher and Endele on September 30th stipulated that Southern Cameroons would separate from Nigeria in October 1960 when Nigeria would become independent. UK trusteeship would be extended to no later than October 1962 by which Southern Cameroons should be independent. The issues of a plebsite were to be integration with Nigeria versus reunification with French Cameroon. By proposing to extend the deadline for the plebsite past the date of Nigeria's independence on October 1st, 1960, 
Andrew Cohen had masterfully delivered on Fongia's desire to separate from Nigeria without actually losing anything in return. The fourth committee of the UN was not pleased that Andrew Cohen had brokered a deal behind their backs and without their consent or involvement. Cohen, Menon and others retorted that their approach had yielded results which had so far eluded the fourth committee. The Andrew Cohen compromise deal incited protests in southern Cameroons. The KNDP protested Fonch's decision to accept the second plebiscite question and the party's leadership under Augustine Dewar considered deposing Foncha as Premier. Southern Cameroonians publicly opposed the decision based on the chosen plebiscite questions because neither was the people's first choice. While some cheered separation from Nigeria, the Barfoot population group decried the extended trusteeship, calling it further colonialism. As the telegraphic petitions poured into the UN from southern Cameroons, the representatives of Ghana, Guinea, Liberia, Libya, Mexico, Sudan, Tunisia, the United States, the United Arab Republic, Cuba, Iran and Panama got to work drafting a resolution based on the Andrew Cohen Compromise Deal. In his introductory remarks to the General Assembly on the draft resolution on October 16, 1959, the representative of Ireland, Mr Kennedy, stated that in arranging for the people of Southern Cameroons to make the difficult choice of joining its neighbours to the east or west, the United Nations was acting in the spirit and in compliance with the UN Charter. He couldn't have been more wrong. By adopting the Andrew Cohen Compromise into a resolution, the UN had essentially rubber-stamped the UK's wishes for Southern Cameroons, in total disregard of the overwhelming majority of the freely expressed wishes of the people of the territory. In response to Mr Kennedy, the representative of Iraq, Mr Adnan Pachachi, questioned the urgency and wisdom of rushing a resolution on the plebiscite questions, when the plebiscite itself had been postponed by more than a year. Mr. Pachachi further emphasised that it made no sense to proceed with a resolution on Southern Cameroons when the plebiscite in Northern Cameroons was yet to be conducted in November 1959. For these reasons, he indicated that Iraq would be abstaining from the vote on the pending resolution. After the debates, the General Assembly passed resolution 1352 on the future of Southern Cameroons, deciding that the plebiscite would take place between September 30th, 1960 and March 1961, recommending that the two questions to be asked in the plebiscite be, do you wish to achieve independence by joining the Independent Federation of Nigeria? Do you wish to achieve independence by joining the Independent Republic of Cameroon? Recommending that Southern Cameroon separate from the Federation of Nigeria no later than October 1st, 1960, imposing a plebiscite choice between an unpopular option and an even more unpopular option, the resolution biased the course of action available to the people of Southern Cameroons. The resolution completely disregarded the conclusions of the August 1959 Manfi Conference, overrode the freely expressed wishes of the people of Southern Cameroons and set the territory on a perilous path. Considering the power of the UK as the administrating authority in Southern Cameroons all the way to the UN, Southern Cameroons' hands were tied behind its back. To the chagrin of the UK government, the people of Northern Cameroons voted in the November 1959 plebiscite not to join Nigeria. In response to, and no doubt at the behest of the UK, the UN passed Resolution 1471 in December 1959, deciding that the same two questions it had recommended for Southern Cameroons be presented in a plebiscite to the people of Northern Cameroons before March 1961. And the UK's fingerprints were all over Article 9. It completely discounted the effect of allowing Northern Cameroonians participate in elections in Nigeria ahead of a plebiscite on their future. The UK would later use this opportunity 
to openly and aggressively lobby the people of Northern Cameroons towards integration with Nigeria.